we listen to Jason Xu, Xu, who comes from the de Department of Statistical Science of Duke University. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've learned so much from all of you uh, to be at this workshop and just all these disciplines. It's really amazing. I feel like I'm in like a language immersion summer camp or something. Um, and speaking of, I'm going to be mostly speaking in the language of statistics here. So for the young ones in the audience, that's the old name for data science. And um, in particular, I want to talk about how we fit these epidemic models, the stochastic version uh, to, to data. And if anything, my goal here will be to kind of motivate the types of challenges, uh, why they are rich problems, interesting problems for mathematicians, economists, and all sorts of people to, uh, to, to work on. So this introduction is going to be a little redundant after so many wonderful talks today, but in many disciplines, whether we want to actually understand how a disease spreads or something similar like gossip, opinions, or what on the network, it's uh, often desirable to have good models that have some features that I will uh, talk about. In particular, I I'm going to be biased toward talking about mechanistic models. So sometimes we want to be able to uh, use some of the knowledge we know about how that is spreading. And also uh, by having a mechanistic model, sometimes the parameters we want to learn about are interpretable because they correspond to certain physical mechanisms. Um, uh, an important thing that has come up a lot throughout this workshop is we would like to hopefully account for some kind of structure and or rates of contacts in the population. So we've seen a lot of the classical models have this sort of mass action type thing, this well mixing homog homogeneity. And we would like to see how far we can get in doing inference when we relax some of that. And again, this is uh, statistics. So I'm biased toward random mod stochastic models. In our case, we want to allow for randomness and I will focus on the continuous time setting in this case, because again, they're very interpretable. They're kind of very general and things can be quite elegant in that framework. So uh, I wanna talk about inference. Uh, we've seen a lot of great talks about sort of, I think a lot of mathematical results, whether they're for the deterministic or the stochastic versions, they often, relate to what I will call forward behavior of the process. So what are the thresholds going forward, the final sizes, these kinds of uh, limits, limiting theorems. But uh, inference, statisticians are often concerned with the inverse problem. So not what kind of data does a model generate, but given observational data, how do we go backwards and identify the most likely parameters, hopefully also with corresponding estimates of the uncertainty of our estimates. So again, my, my main goal, because it's such a diverse audience, is to kind of give a taste of the interesting and beautiful challenges that arise in considering this problem, and also understanding why it's hard, even for the simplest models. And then I'll kind of give a little proof of principle in uh, how we relax these assumptions in some cases. Okay. This has also come up multiple times today, but just as a refresher, the SIR model, which is often attributed to this seminal work almost 100 years ago by Kermack and McKendrick, is a process of infection uh, that kind of treats the population by compartments. Uh, based on disease status. So susceptible people flow into the infectious compartment and eventually recover. And so um, many people in this audience know uh, the kermack mckendrick model often refers to this simple diagram depicted here. But in that paper, they actually do some things very generally. They write things in terms of freedom, endocrine regions. It's, it's really lovely. And I encourage people to look at the original paper. But uh, for some reason, when people say the kermack mckendrick model, they mostly colloquially refer to this simple model where there's a fixed parameter beta, and a fixed parameter gamma that refer to the rates of transmission, which I'll make a little more clear in the next slide. Uh, and so infection and recovery. Uh, even in the general case, they considered everything was deterministic in this original treatment. And uh, in particular, in the simple case, we can describe it by a system of ordinary differential equations, ODEs, uh, where uh, we see that given an initial condition and certain choices for those parameters, you will have fixed trajectories, of course, and there are these nice smooth continuous curves over time. Uh, this is going to be familiar. It's related to the lack of Volterra dynamics or predation prey. Um, so this is a, the simplest case of the SIR model. And it's even though it's deterministic, I do want to emphasize that it is there's a nonlinear term here because of the interaction between susceptibles and infecteds. And that's going to give us some headaches when we try to do statistics on this. For a stochastic version of the model, we can write down things that basically look the same as those differential equations but interpret these as instead instantaneous jump rates of a Markov jump process or continuous time Markov chain. So these instantaneous rates, rather than being derivatives of a smooth function, are now um, the instantaneous rates of the probability of these discrete events happening, whether the infection occurs, which means S population decreases by one, I population increases by one, recovery event where R increases by one, I decreases by one, et cetera. 
And then for, for uh, completeness, we have this event rate of nothing occurring. Okay, so there's a lot of work uh, that has been known in this audience uh, on how one can justify the deterministic limit um, using sort of the strong approximation or Kurtz theory. And uh, I, I recently learned that Etienne has great work on this for more general settings with the non-Markovian setting last year. Um, but in our case, uh, this is gonna evolve as a continuous time Markov chain. And just, I'm gonna assume a closed population for exposition here. So let's just contract two of the populations as the last one can be recovered by subtraction. Written as, as is, this is assuming implicitly already the, this random mixing uh, sort of mass action type assumption. Uh, however you wanna call it in your discipline, everyone is kind of bumping into each other in a homogeneous way at a constant rate, or for instance, along a complete graph. Okay. That's how we get this beta times S times I dynamic. Okay, and in the stochastic version, of course, we no longer have necessarily fixed trajectories. If I fix beta and gamma and I simulate from the model, this is just one realization. And of course we see it's a little bumpy because of the randomness. But I do wanna say uh, the stochasticity also adds to the interpretability in, in a lot of ways. So first of all, we've talked a lot about basic reproductive numbers. Um, in this model, it's parameterized by those, uh, by those uh, mechanistic parameters. It's sort of beta divided by gamma, and then you might have to normalize depending on the way you define the model. And when, when epidemiologists, when public health officials talk about this quantity, they say it's an average number of secondary infections, however you wanna say it. But I think this notion of average makes a lot more sense in a stochastic model where things really are occurring with a probability law, right? So rather than some kind of time average that's a little bit abstracted through maybe a next generation eigenvalue. And so this is appealing. And for instance, of course, there are other terms that would we would like to naturally have a probabilistic interpretation, like the probability of a large outbreak or the probability we peak at this time, rather than having them fixed based on uh, some, some differential equations. Right. Now, again, that was in the well-mixed case. Naturally, one might be interested in eventually relaxing that well-mixing assumption. And here's just a, a diagram depicting this in a simple setting. If you have five individuals, under the SIR, we are implicitly assuming that the contact structure is a complete graph, right? Anybody can, can come in contact with anyone, and in particular, an infected individual can infect any susceptible. But in practice, we might not have a complete graph, and in fact, that graph on the right might change over time. So we would like to incorporate that. And this is indeed motivated by a lot of recent data. We talk about contact trace and things like that. Uh, one of the data sets we've analyzed that I'll talk about in, in this talk, just because there's so many network-oriented people in the audience, is that... Uh, we might have mobile health data. In this case, it's an experimental setting. So it's not easy to come by this kind of monitoring uh, in the US, but in an experiment, this was looking at the spread of flu-like symptoms on a college campus. And so people were equipped with Bluetooth apps that are pinging when they're close enough and stop pinging when they're far away. So that's gonna inform us of who is close enough to be counted as a contact over time. And we can observe how this contact changes. And in our data set, we see that there's a pretty low network density. And of course it's, changing. So it's certainly not a complete graph and it's certainly not static. And when you don't observe this, you might expect that, well, this is probably happening. So in this talk, I'll talk about one uh, approach, sort of a first attempt of ours, where we try to model the dynamics here and sort of the interplay. In particular, that contact network should impact the disease spread, of course, because you can only spread to your contacts. But your disease status might describe how you choose to interact. So even though we do not have an economic framework, uh, we do want to have your sort of formation of edge and deletion of edge rates to possibly depend on the disease statuses of the vertices. And then again, this is really focused on statistics. So you might actually think that these models are pretty simple, uh, and I agree. But in particular, we're gonna try to do everything so that we have access to the likelihood function and so that we can fit the model to observe data and sort of have it, have our inference be exact under the model, right? So if we believe the model, we're getting the right estimates on uncertainty properties. And again, these models are, of course, going to be misspecified, but it's important to know what the estimates are under your model so you can isolate where the error is coming from. So you, so you have, you don't do it on the complete graph anymore. You have some given network. Do you assume you know the network? Do you assume your evolution of the, is it a random network? Do you want to just estimate the parameters of the random network? Is yeah. the network yeah. fixed before the so, infection so, or does it evolve while the infection yeah. these evolves? Are, these are all great questions. We'll get to them and there's gonna be many slides later, but the important thing is that we in this data set are observing that network continuously, okay? And we still would like to learn its parameters. So we still jointly model it with the epidemic. Um, and that 
that is something that in future work we'd like to know like how we can impute that network or just model it uh, via some rules and but uh for now we're going to observe that network and we're going to have missing data in the disease uh, summaries so the network is totally it's, it's it's observed totally yeah but we want to still describe we want to posit that it was it's generated from a random process which we'll see yes great question so the partial observations I'm hinting at will be limited in this talk to the disease statuses and not the network. And uh, hopefully many of you can help us deal with the network uh, issue. Okay. But so before getting to the network stuff, I wanna motivate again, just kind of really motivate the challenges. So why do I claim that the, uh, it's hard to do inference under these models, even these simple ones where I can write down in one slide and you can all understand. So, um, well, we, first of all, there's a lot of people who are doing approximations, so there, there must be something difficult about it. And some common approximations are to use discret discretizations over time. Uh, there's something that's been mentioned a lot in this workshop for early stages, because the susceptible population is not really being depleted in a significant way, we can have a single type branching process that's kind of a, a birth death growth of the infections. And then for large populations, we can use things like diffusions, uh, you know, SDE type approaches. There was plenty more local constancy at certain times, the time series SIR of Koshimay and Ferguson. And then uh, even under approximations, I would say the tools for inference tend to be computationally intensive. So in particular, most of them, the majority of them are simulation based. And what I mean is they're based on sort of simulating virtual outbreaks and hoping that they kind of match your data. So that's my layman's explanation of that. This includes sequential Monte Carlo or particle filtering, as well as sequential ABC, which is a further approximation of this. And I don't have anything against these methods. I think they're very powerful in general. I also think it's great how they're kind of plug and play and many practitioners can use them. But from my limited experience, they can be sort of, uh, they work well when they do and when they don't, you might be stuck, right? And so for, uh, furthermore, just statistically, you can see that sometimes they suffer poor mixing, uh, degeneracy when weights are kind of stuck and uh, just basically just non-trivial to implement, non-trivial to uh, pull off computationally. So even for SIR or the homogeneous So um, uh, the question was, is this even true of SIR? So I think it's really a computational problem that it's, it's, it depends on your data set. So I can talk more about this offline, but it's not that it's hard to simulate the process. That's easy. It's like if you simulate the process and your data, you know, your data is not generated from SIR, right? So you're trying to tweak the parameters and have things pass through your observed data, but you might have to reject a lot of things that don't, or if you have something that reweighs, those weights might become degenerate. And you can have really contradict paradoxical things like sometimes these methods might work better when you have noisier data because there's more a sampling noise to let your particle filter kind of carry through the particles. Whereas if you have finer data, it actually gets stuck more. So I can talk more about that offline. It's a great question though. Um, and it's great to question what I'm saying because like the simple SIR model is simple. So why, why is it hard? And so uh, even for the recent Ebola outbreak, you know, a lot of the World Health Organization estimates are based on deterministic things. So instead we wanna um, sort of advocate a likelihood based uh, method for the, for the stochastic case. And you still might be skeptical because, okay, the SIR model is actually a really nice mathematical object. So for those of you who do statistics, things like the likelihood function should be nice. So let me give a little bit of background. When we have a continuous time Markov chain, it is sort of uh, fundamentally defined by this quantity called the infinitesimal generator or rate matrix. I'm gonna denote that Q. And so uh, in a Markov chain, you usually have a transition probability matrix, which is each step, where does it go? And they're really probabilities. Here, these are instantaneous rates. And in fact, the sums of the rows will sum to zero. And what I mean by instantaneous rates is that, for instance, if you have two uh, states in your state space denoted X and Y, the X, Y entry of this matrix tells you the rate of the exponential waiting time moving from X to Y. So when I'm in state X, the rate of jumping out, I can jump to any of the other states. So I'm summing over the rates of the second argument, and that's my total leaving time, right? Uh, you can think of it as like an exponential alarm clock to move here, a different one to move here. And then um, the minimum of those, the first state is what happens. And uh, of course, the minimum of a bunch of exponentials is has a rate as their sum of the rates. So the diagonal entries give that rate of jumping out and um, the diagonal itself is the negative so that the rows are conserved to zero. So it's a non-explosive process. And you can imagine in the exponential, the Markov case, the likelihood should be simple because what happens is your chain is choosing where to move based on exponential waiting times, and the likelihood should be a contribution of exponential densities, basically. It's a very nice expression. It's a member of the exponential family, has a really nice, it's easy to work with, right? So, so far, we, everything is still easy. So you should, it should be easy statistically. 
just a little simplification, when I collect those terms for a general continuous time Markov chain, I can factor it so that what happens is that the likelihood of a trajectory is the product of all the transition rates between the states I observe and the dwell times, so the other part of the exponential uh, distribution, uh, e to the time I've spent in each state x. So when I take the log of that, if I asked an undergraduate in statistics to find the maximum likelihood estimator, right? That's likelihood-based inference. They could differentiate that, set it equal to zero, and just tell me uh, on a homework problem that you know the MLE for each of these rates is just um, based on these sufficient statistics. I count the number of transitions of each type and divide by the dwell time in that first state. So this, and there's a theory of inference for this, there's central limit theorems. And if you wanna be Bayesian, there's also really nice posterior um, conjugate relationships. You can put gamma priors on the rows of this and have really simple updates. Okay. So inference is quite nice for this class of models and we're still in the Markov setting. So what do I mean when the inverse problem is hard under the simple models? Cause the SIR model, I haven't put it into this notation but it's, it's a case of this. So it's because of missing data, right? If we are observing, for instance, incidents, we're only observing one compartment. And also if we're observing things like let's say daily or weekly, we're observing summaries of the possible realizations and the, the sort of complete data should cross through our observations. What do I mean by that? And this is a terrible picture, I'm sorry. But like, let's say the why are observed data of something like infections and uh, we have uh, every week. So why not, why one is week one, week two, week three. So the dotted line passes through those and the step function is one continuous time Markov chain trajectory, right? So you can go up and down, up and down, as long as it passes through my observed data. But then the solid line is another instance with you know, a different probability, a different likelihood that also is consistent with my observed data. So if I only have partial data, I need to base my inference uh, on the likelihood of my observations. And that should somehow be related to summing over and accounting for the probabilities of all the paths that are consistent with what I observed, right? So that problem is simply called like marginalization, right? Or integrating over the latent space, uh, but it can be hard for models like this, okay? This is too much notation, but what I mean to say is when you have the observed data, instead of having that nice form where you have exponential waiting times between each exact event that happens, you don't observe those events. You only observe uh, you know, these, these things at an observation schedule. And now what you need is the probability of going between states over some observation time, right? And in full generality, that time, we'd like to be able to have these transition probabilities uh, for any finite time. This is the transient behavior of that process, which is very- What's the situation that you observe at some given time points? Uh, what is the situation? So the question was, what is the situation about what you observe? I think here, let me try to answer your question. So, you know, if you have the continuous time process, like if there's a million people, there's going to be tons of infections and recoveries all the time. And that defines the nice likelihood, the complete data likelihood, gives me access to these terms. If instead I have reports of total new infections every week, right, incidence data, then I'm in this setting. And I would like those times to write down these things and do this pen and paper calculation. But instead, I need to have multiple bold Xs. I, there's infinitely many of them I need to marginalize over, right? Okay. Great question. And so you can do this in general for continuous time Markov chains in theory. Like the, re, the way you relate the instantaneous rates to these probabilities in finite time is there's a beautiful relationship based on the matrix exponential. But we can't really compute this in practice for epidemic models and other large population processes, okay? Because it's, it's cubic in the size of the state space. And this is not just the size of your population. It's like the triplets of S, I, and R over that population. That's something we don't want to work with. So I know there's going to be a long intro because I want to motivate sort of the, the whole area. Okay, so um, we've taken some approaches for similar processes. These are just teasers. So these next four slides, they look the most technical, but they're the ones you, have to, you can zone out the most. So uh, some of you might know there was a great comment from Greg last time about how, you know, a lot of times these differential equations can actually serve as master equations for the stochastic processes. And in particular, that actually holds for the generating functions of such processes in cases such as branching processes, as many of you are familiar with. There's a lot of beautiful mathematics because there's so much structure there. So in the past, when I've worked with branching processes, even multi-type ones, you can define a generating function, which anytime you do this in probability, you kind of pull it out as a sort of a contrived tool, right? You define this object, and the whole point of this object is the coefficients or probabilities you care about. And the game to play is, can I characterize this whole object? And then can I pull out those coefficients? So just the usual definition of a branching, pro of a generating function, 
it turns out that this satisfies a bunch of differential equations defined by those forward, backward, or master equations. So we have taken approaches where we solve those equations, maybe numerically, maybe in closed form, and then try to pull out these probabilities. And even though you don't want to numerically solve ODEs and then numerically differentiate like a thousand times, you can use you know, Fourier transforms to, to do this super fast and get them all out at the same time. So kind of neat, just wanted to point that in case it's related to your work. But this also doesn't work well for nonlinear processes. Okay, so branching processes, things like that are rate linear. That gives us a lot of the structure we use here. For nonlinear processes, it's much harder, right? And we have that in SIR. We have this interaction term. It really like ruins our lives. And um, there, there is some recent work we had that did overcome this in the simplest case of the SIR, right? So we're still on the simple case of the SIR. I haven't talked about the network. Um, and I also want to point out, again, a plug for Kermack and McKendrick in case they're listening. Uh, in the 1927 paper, they're already giving a lot of uh, intuition on how important the sort of relations in the Laplace domain are, even in the deterministic case. And here, instead of doing the uh, sort of Fourier series trick, it turns out we can study the transition probabilities of the process in the Laplace domain and derive a recursion that has a continued fraction representation. So if, if you've studied birth death processes, Carlin and McGregor knew this about half a century ago for birth death processes, even general ones without linear rates. And the difference between us and them is I have a MacBook Pro, so I can actually sometimes do things numerically with these representations, okay? So again, this is just a teaser. Uh, I'm going through the details here uh, kind of quickly. But the nice thing about exploiting these relationships is this was, you know, it was actually considered a very challenging problem to ever work with that marginal likelihood. So I've seen that in... So, so I have seen that in certain cases where you have exchangeability for your processes and then it sort of becomes easier. But here you don't have some exchangeability. So why does this work? Yeah, it's not easy, <laughs> but um, it, it kind of, uh, it's a, there's a nice trick to work with these sort of inter increments and then they decouple to some extent, but then there's still a sort of dynamic way that they build upon each other. It's, it's, it's really intricate in fact. And the uh, part of the motivation for the rest of this talk, this is still the intro, is that um, these are delicate indeed. And so if I wanna do anything like remove the complete graph assumption, I, well, I'm not smart enough to do it. Maybe some people in the audience can do it, but it, it is very delicate. Great question. And I haven't thought as deeply about exchangeability as I'd like, but I have a note on that at the very end of this talk too. So we can do something numerical with this. We can use Abate and uh, Ward Witt's techniques to do the numerical inversion, and we can actually compute those likelihoods uh, for the marginal data and, and try to do something numerical. It's just, it doesn't, it, it's slow and it's a little bit delicate, as you can imagine, for the simplest case of the SIR, which is already very difficult. So this is, this is work with, uh, the first author is Lam Ho, and this is with uh, Forrest Crawford, who did related work on birth death processes and Mark Suchard. Okay, so finally, let's move past this, having shown you sort of the nightmares one can encounter, even though they're fun nightmares, even working with the simple case, when you try to reconstruct or impute or marginalize over that process, okay? So I claim that it's not easy to do these for more complex models when we wanna drop the complete graph. We wanna maybe drop the Markovian assumption, which epidemiologists really wanna do. And when we wanna put in more individual level heterogeneity, having rates with covariates, maybe further like you know, now at this workshop, putting in economic incentives, putting in environmental terms. But let's try to see how far we can get still using likelihood-based inference via an alternative approach. Because when we have hard integrals, uh, Bayesians will tell you, well, sometimes we can evaluate hard integrals with Markov chain Monte Carlo, right? So the idea is, can I replace a direct integration with sampling? And even though there's gonna be some conservation of difficulty, maybe I can sample from something that'll, that'll make my life a little easier. Okay. So this was kind of quick. Any questions before we go on to the next part of this talk? So the idea here, how do we, what is the core idea or the high level idea of changing this difficult marginalization integration to a sampling problem, All right? So here's a sort of sloppy high level notation. And um, now Z is the complete data with all the infection and recovery times. And I only have partial data, which is now called X. So when I want the likelihood of that partial data, like I said, you need to somehow incorporate, you need to marginalize over all the missing data with respect to some measure over the missing data. So I'm just saying there's some kind of integral over the missing data and the observed data, but I've, I've integrated over the missing data somehow. And that's the integral I've claimed is so hard. So how can I change this to a sampling problem? So when you're a Bayesian and you do something like Markov chain Monte Carlo, 
you try to use Bayes rule and you're learning about the parameters of the process, right? So I'd like the posterior distribution, some distribution on theta given X. But when I flip that around using Bayes rule, this hard likelihood in red appears. So what if instead I construct a expanded Markov chain that's gonna look at the posterior distribution, explore the whole distribution of both the missing data and the parameters jointly. When I flip that term around via Bayes rule, the blue likelihood, the nice one that's tractable, the exponential family, that is the one that I use in my calculations, okay? And so if I'm able to somehow do this, I'm gonna to have to explore a larger space with my Markov chain. But if I can target that joint posterior, every computation, whether it's metropolis Hastings and I need to evaluate a ratio with the likelihood or, or something else like Gibbs, those computations actually simplify greatly. So computationally, it's, it's very quick on even a laptop. So the idea is to use a Markov chain to look for the posterior distribution, do a random walk over the posterior distribution biased so that it preserves the, uh, the, the data posterior on this joint posterior between uh, both the missing data and the parameters of interest. And let's say I am originally interested in the parameters given my observed data. So what I really wanted originally was pi of theta given x. And now I have pi of z comma theta given x. Now marginalizing out the missing data becomes uh, trivial. I have a bunch of pairs, theta one, z one, theta two, z two. If I just ignore the z's, this is a correct sample from the theta posterior. And you can convince yourself of this based on looking at the empirical distribution. And this is not my idea. This is like a general idea called Bayesian data augmentation. So maybe if this is a new idea for you, it's a, it's a very nice one. There is a conservation of difficulty because the marginalization converts to somehow sampling over the missing data. And that's, that's the name of the game. But we'll see that this perspective might give us a little more, uh, more flexibility to, with the modeling. So now we can talk a little bit about our attempt to incorporate a contact network that at least co-evolves with the SIR model, uh, making use of this idea. So back to this figure, let's say we have five people and we have a non-complete graph. So we have um, an adjacency matrix that can uh, represent which edges are currently present in this uh, network. And then to allow this to be dynamic, maybe that matrix A should itself be a process where its entries should also change over time. So just the simplest way to do this is let's say this is also a Markov process switching between one and zero. And then hopefully those rates of contact and deletion will depend on disease status. That would be nice, right? So that's, that's, a, that's like the minimum to, to have this uh, coupled with the network in any way. So in particular, uh, with some rate, I'm gonna call the rates alpha for connection. It should depend on the disease status of the nodes, but with some rate, they will connect. And also depending on the disease status of the nodes, with some rate omega, they will break their link. Right? So these will be part of the model. And we see that at least they depend on the disease status. Simultaneously, of course, the SIR process is happening over this network. And we would like it to be just the generalization of the uh, complete graph case. So it should have the same dynamics in the sense that over an existing edge, an infectious individual infects with rate beta, right? Okay. Uh, the recovery dynamics are actually identical because that doesn't really pertain to the network. So at, at the individual level, and we've also had some remarks on, you can sort of think about agent-based or individual-based interpretations, and you can then lump them together into a population level. So at the individual level, each individual has certain neighbors and they can pass on an infection with rate beta along each edge. They recover independently. And then there's also sort of just links between potential links that are becoming added and deleted, right? As far as the subscripts on the link rates, we're assuming that recovered and susceptibles are both sort of in a healthy class just to reduce parameters. And then the uh, in infected and the sort of healthy unhealthy links behave differently. So when I aggregate this at the population level, what happens? So the overall infection rate or sort of uh, population level hazard becomes a product, of course, of that rate per edge and the total number of edges between susceptible and infected. So this is actually not the best notation because this is meant to see SI of T, which is different than S of T times I of T. But if you have a complete graph, then the number of SI links is S of T times I of T, okay? So in some sense, this is just a simple generalization of the complete data case. And now, of course, recovery sums up, and we have the link activations and terminations also summing up, but needing new notation to count the number of types of pairs. So, Jason, are you assuming that you have some kind of configuration model here? So, so are these links randomly connecting? 
Or, yes. Um, so in, in this with case, with the same probability, or, or so, what's what's the yes about the sort of um, links here, right? There's sort of a at, at every uh, set of disease statuses, there's just certain types of links that can or can't exist, and they're happening kind of independently. I don't really know how to call that, but it certainly is not. Um, it doesn't have to do with choosing things based on degrees or anything like that. There's sort of edges in sets that are maybe separated by type, and then everything happens independently within those sets. Oh, wait. So is this stochastic block model network model? Uh, it's not a stochastic block model, as far as I can tell. What is your network? It's not configuration. It's not stuff. Uh, so I think we are confused here because some of things it is a configuration model, some things it's a stochastic block model, but it's what's your network model? I, I'm, I'm actually terrible at all the terminology that I've just learned, but okay. I mean, write the network on the whiteboard without so, terminology. Uh, yes. Um, okay. So be, and it's the other thing is because I've seen a lot of those presented in, in the case where sort of the vertex set is not changing statuses, but in some sense, if you have so let's say the circles are, um, are healthy and then the X's are unhealthy. Okay, so at every, uh, you know, at this instant in time, because these are the disease statuses, then let's look at the number of um, potential healthy. So, so there's a certain type of edge between um, healthy and not healthy, right? And so here is a set of, uh, of all of those, oh, sorry, this is not this is not one. So yeah, there's another. Okay, so there's something. Maybe there's more. And so some of these are currently disconnected, and some of these are currently connected. Okay, because there's you know there's a process for the adjacency matrices. And then so how? Oh, they but switch. this process has nothing to do with the underlying network. It has to do with your data augmentation to simulate. You're still inferring on the complete graph. I guess you can think of it as there's an under, yeah, so the, so this is something that I don't know how to clarify, but in some sense, our model doesn't have any structure in terms of social structure, right? This is why I say it's not like a stochastic block model. There's an sort of a, there's a, the network is still complete, but there's our edges and being deleted and added back in this, in certain rates. So I don't okay. know what I would call that. And what I'm trying to say here is if the solid uh, edges are currently there, then, you know, there's, exponential waiting times for when this will be deleted and this will be deleted uh, and, and similarly competing with when these will be added and those times depend on the current disease status of the nodes, right? And then, but these things are also competing in the same jumbled up uh, set of exponential times. And then the moment this one, for instance, recovers, then the rate this edge will be deleted changes as well. Yeah, and they're kind of getting, they're switching on and off, but the set of potential edges is complete and the rates of when they're being added and removed depend on the current disease status. So I can think of it some behavioral model. If I know my friend is sick, I may drop the edge at some probability yes. or I would randomly say, add them. And yes, so I don't know the name for it, but exactly that. But in some sense, you're giving me a little too much credit because there's no friends here, right? It's like you still have, yes, but your behavior- oh, but I currently have friend. Calmly, these two nodes here have an edge, so they're friends. Yeah, and okay, perfect. With some yes. probability, you drop that eyes are just, even if both are healthy, but if both are sick, maybe if they have some different rate, if one is sick, one's healthy, still have a different rate. Yes, absolutely. So you have some kind of dynamic network model, which doesn't have an underlying structure. There's no underlying be... structure, exactly. And that's so important. That's something I'd like to... It looks, I think it looks more like a percolation model. It is very similar to percolation, but I'm always, I'm always a little hesitant to use the exact words because there's adding and the rates are changing, but it's, it's kind of similar to percolation indeed. But it also sounds like you are assuming that these are exponential times. So, so this yes, is yeah. still a Markov model. Absolutely. On yeah. on some kind of augmented space mm -hmm. when you have the, the the edges now that are being added or removed, right? Yeah. So everything is Markov for now. Yes. And what do you want to learn? The question. So um, the question was, what do you want to learn? So I want to learn the beta and gamma, which will be modulated by the fact that the network is changing. But one can also estimate. Um, the network rates, of course, if you're interested in the probabilities of disconnecting when you're healthy versus not, you can learn something from that. I will say, again, because the network is completely observed in our case, it's a little bit contrived to learn the network rates in the full, uh, full method I will present because you could have learned them separately just from the network because it's fully observed, okay? You could have like conditioned on that, but that's a more subtle point. The thing is, 
Epidemiologists might think of this as making the model more realistic in order to estimate beta and gamma effectively, but one can also, you know, learn and interpret the link rates. Wait, this is super confusing to me because your network actually is coupled to the state of the disease. So I could actually could not tell me at all who is infected and susceptible because now I could sort of possibly, since the network is completely known, I can sort of see by the frequency at which edges switch, whether it's an edge between susceptible. So you get partial information from just seeing the network without even knowing the disease status. You do get partial information from seeing the network. Yes, I, I didn't follow your complete comment. Well, it's not as if you have an underlying fixed network which involves independent of the disease. They've devolved together. And therefore, yes. if I if you gave me no information about the network, only about the disease, only about the network, I could, should still be able to possibly infer parameters of the disease. If you gave me, sorry, if you gave me what? So I let's say your what? gamma would be zero. Yeah. Okay. Then eventually everybody's infected. And then I see that all your rates of the edges switching are those between type I and I. So I could actually see that from your network data without ever seeing the disease status of the nodes. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I totally follow. So let's talk about this a little bit uh, offline. Yeah, I think it's, a, I just, I need to parse the question, sorry. <laughs> yes, um, but I'm, I'm very interested to discuss that. Sorry. What Christian says is that, for instance, if you see that between two vertices, you have uh, edges appearing or disappearing, you can say that these vertices are I or S. Well, if you, we have we have observation of where the edges are and are not. And yeah, I mean, if you so you can you, you, you would know hope at that you certain could, time whether the vertex vertices are I or S. You you, for instance, if if an edge is deleted, you know exactly at this point that one of the vertices should be I and the other should be S. That's what well, I well but no, mean. I mean, they, they can, the thing is it can happen regardless, right? I mean, these edges can be deleted for healthy pairs too. And there's rates that differ because you would think that you would disconnect more if somebody's unhealthy. And so if you know those rates, you can back out the disease statuses if you observe the network, that's right. But if you don't know the rates, then, then you, yeah. yeah if you observe the evolution of the graph, you can, you can estimate the rates. Yeah, so you can, that's, this is what I mean by when you observe the complete network, you could first estimate these rates and conditions of that. But right now I'm trying to motivate just the joint model, right? We do see up to, to some extent on how the, the processes are linked, right? And the, in the complete data case, inference is, is weird because you can do it in a two-stage procedure. There's a question back here from Dan. So, so actually, when you don't get to observe the exact time points of infections and recoveries, you cannot estimate those link uh, rates because the link rates are convoluted with the disease statuses of individuals at those particular time points. So you still have to find ways to impute or figure out those time points of epidemic events before we can fully learn those uh, link rates of the network. Yeah, I will say, so Fan is an author on this. She knows this well too. I just, I, I'm having a hard time following sort of in these hypothetical scenarios, what I am completely observing and what I'm not. So I, I kind of agree, if you knew all the disease statuses and then you observe the complete network, you can kind of split things up and back other things out. But let's let's go on a little bit and hopefully when I get to the data setting, that might make it a little more clear. Yeah. So yeah, the point is these, these processes are kind of, they're all happening in one Markov process, like Greg asked, and um, it's Markovian for now, but that will allow us to write down the sort of, in principle, simple likelihood of a continuous time Markov chain. Okay, so there's a lot of notation. Again, don't get fixated on notation. Just trust that this is in the same form of the nice likelihoods at the beginning, which is a product of sort of nice exponential terms to the number of times events occurred. And then a dwell time, this is written as an integral. We've seen hard integrals in many talks, but in the Markov case, this integral splits up to a bunch of very simple sums. Okay, so the point is this is indeed a nice expression that we can evaluate very quickly when we use this within an iterative algorithm, such as a MCMC sampler. Um, again, I don't exactly know how to call this even, but I will say like a lot of other uh, similar models there, uh, such as like preventative wiring and things like that, I would say their properties 
are a little more dependent on the degrees of vertices as the as the network evolves. And there are advantages to that because when you want to preserve things like total degree, you can do analysis on the thresholds of these models probabilistically. Our aim is like having, having things kind of being independent, not having structure will allow us to write down a likelihood like this. Okay, so it leads, it leads to being able to write down the complete data likelihood of, of the Markov process, which is nice. Okay, so we would hopefully like to leverage this even though we're not observing everything. We are observing the whole network, but we're not observing everything. And again, the MLEs and the conjugate relationships, like I said, also go through. You don't need to worry about the form. The point is these are closed forms that you can implement in R in like basically one line each. When you have those, we can sort of validate the model. Uh, you know, if you simulate the complete data and observe the complete data, you can see that sort of an empirical consistency as you observe more events of those estimates, kind of just validating the form of that likelihood and the derivation of this model. So again, we're, we're just in a partially observed case. Here's another plot of the same phenomenon. If I have things like incidence data, I have the number of new infections. If I see four infections in a week, you know, my trajectory could look like that or it could look like this. And it depends on the number of recoveries, it depends on the initial size, and we don't know all those things. In our case, I'm going to focus on uh, the setting where we don't know the recovery times, kind of like this is trying to show. And of course, by not knowing the recovery times, we don't even know the number of recoveries per observation interval. Okay. So that, that's the nature of the data set that we're motivated by in this case. We have weekly data, and over each week, we have these health status reports that will, for instance, tell us about the number of new recoveries summarized over the week, but we don't have those event times that give us access to the nice likelihood. And so, um, again, because of the Bluetooth app, we're saying that we do know the times of social creation, uh, link creation and deletion, okay? But we, we're not observing all the disease statuses of those, of those people, which will depend on the latent variables here, right? Because if a certain number of recoveries happen in this week, your I and S population depends on that. So that, that kind of... We, we don't actually know the disease statuses all the time, even though we observe what links are between people. If that, if that helps, I, again, I didn't follow exactly what was on in your question, but I hope this helps. So the observed data is basically missing the recoveries in this case. And at the very end of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, missing infection times as well. So how does data augmented MCMC look? Uh, you know, I've mentioned that we're trying to somehow introduce the latent variables for the missing data and explore both of them in Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, in this case, we're, we do this kind of alternating scheme where we first propose either the values of the missing data and accept reject, or we can sample them directly if we can get our hands on the conditional distribution. And then conditional on the complete data, we have access to that nice likelihood, and we can do things like Gibbs sampling in our case, which just means we have the closed form distribution for the parameters and how to update them okay, for the Markov chain. I realize if you don't know Markov chain Monte Carlo, I'm assuming a lot here, but uh, I'm happy to uh, talk more at length after, after the presentation. So as you might guess, step one is the hard part, right? We're data augmenting, uh, we're kind of proposing things, and we need this to respect the observed data. So like the figure I've showed you, you might think that's hard. It was hard to integrate over those, and it's, it's notoriously difficult also sometimes for large processes to do conditional simulation. Uh, so that is, have a realization from the model, but also have it fixed to pass through your observations. And in particular, that's further complicated by the fact that, well, we observe the contact network, which is great, but that imposes further constraints because uh, even though these edges are kind of behaving independently, they don't know about structure. You know, if you particularly let this person recover and then that's this person's only neighbor and this person needs to get infected later. Sorry, if this person's infectious and this person needs to get infected later, we can't let this person recover at a certain time, right? So the contact network is constraining us even more. But that structure can also help the Markov chain mix, which is a subtle note we can talk about uh, offline. So to not go into too many details, uh, Fan, who's in the audience, the first author of this paper, was able to do this really impressive work that not only proposes the missing data conditional on that, uh, that dynamic network at each step for the imputation, because you, know, you can propose things, you can have an algorithm that you know, moves things around whenever it violates something, but, but propose it in a way that is preserving those probabilities. In particular, this is what we call a Gibbs step in statistics. So it's drawing from the exact conditional distribution. So when we propose the Zs here, we also know that that probability is preserved in our Markov chain. So we don't need to work with, with anything extra there or reject uh, steps. And so this is, you're not gonna understand this figure just from this slide, but the idea is exactly what I said. It's checking that we're not letting somebody recover in a way that violates somebody else who needs that neighbor to be infected, et cetera. It's avoiding all those things, but also somehow doing it in a way that preserves the uh, conditional probabilities. 
So I, I, so essentially this data augmentation step, you say you essentially do rejection sampling, right? So it, it's not rejection sampling. Because it's, that's what I'm confused about. Because kind of like, if you have continuous time, you would have to have continuously yeah. many rejections. Well, no. So, I mean, let's say you have a week. You can propose a set of times somehow. And then um, if those are in violation of something, you might have to move some things around, right? And then maybe when you move some things around to avoid having to reject it, you would think that might change you know now it's a different sample and you might violate yes the, so don't you get biases yeah. from that yeah well this was done in a careful way where you can show that this is actually the way that this is done is a conditional drop so that that's the cool part yeah so you, you it's, it's done in a way that's not biased because naively doing it like maybe proposing things uniformly and then just checking that they accept like that they don't violate is not a condition drop right so you right. can't do this naively exactly so there's a lot of technical work in okay. here but it's pretty cool yes So I'm still trying to sort of parse through this. So, so okay. your data uh -huh. is what exactly? You have the count of, of individuals of different types, and you also have this partial network, right? At different time points. Is that think about it? Think about it as the complete continuous time network. We're kind of assuming we have that, which is right. So so you have all the time instances when the network connections are created. Yeah, like those, we're kind of assuming we know those event times, but we don't know, for instance, the recovery event times. So when we propose those, it changes the you know unknown disease statuses of those. Network almost is a continuous time, and every Friday evening it also is infection. The total number of new recoveries. Oh, totally. I see. The total number, not the actual. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. That's why we have to kind of impute like. Who, like when we say we have, let's say, five recoveries, we got to put them somewhere. And we also have to make sure that they don't violate, you know, they don't need to sum up impossible. So you, every Friday, you know how many people are not susceptible. Yeah. Oh, wait, sorry. I think we do know who's recovered. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. You know who is who. So for each yeah. node, you know their stage yeah. on Friday evening, and you continuously know the address. So I think that you know for every node, their infection state on Friday evening, and you know the whole week continuously the network state from you know, every yeah, edge. Exactly. It's strange. I, it is. I mean, this is not something you would expect in observational data. This is an experiment with a Bluetooth app. It's very strange. Yes, agreed. Um, so it, it was nice because it's a way to validate, you know, this model building methodology. And um, I would love to, you know, uh, we, we'll talk about this at the end a little bit because I hope that will be a little more open to solicit ideas. Don't worry about any of these equations. It's just again. Once I have that hard step, this step is just one line in R for each parameter. It's the Gibbs sampling uh, based on a conjugacy relationship. But uh, yeah. excuse me, yes. can you go one slide back? So why, why is there uh, possibly infected individuals if you know this, the, whether they're infected or not? It's because you don't know if they have recovered. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So they're, they're in the middle of the interval because like, you need to know who was possibly infected to respect future infections that need to occur. But depending on where you put the recoveries, they may or may not be recovered. Exactly. Yeah. So this is something I tend not to like to talk about live because it is the technical step, but it, it can be done. And that, that's what's interesting. It can be done. Right. So um, I'm going to skip over this over uh, for time because it's, it's just about the real data results. So we were able to fit this data set. I actually didn't even talk about the fact that we have an external force of infection, too, because this uh, study was on about 600 students, but only a subset of them had the Bluetooth app. So there's sort of another node outside that's kind of continuously have this immigration rate in, of infection. So um, I don't want to talk about it too much, but uh, the contact information is uh, telling us that it's low network density. It's obviously changing, but very much far from a complete graph at all times. And then so when we analyze this, we were able to jointly infer the parameters and have you know uncertainty quantification under the exact model, which is uh, hard to come by. And so I, you're not going to get much of looking at this table, but they did check out with what we expected and what the epidemiologists knew, which is like the internal force of infection was large. Uh, you know, some of these parameters almost look like different orders of magnitude because there are short contacts, which reflects that low network density. And so this is just to say we were able to fit this data set under this sort of exact approach. Um, I wanna talk about a couple other things in my last few minutes. So let's just discuss this uh, initial attempt first. We do have a generative model that at least has some kind of interplay between the epidemic and network process. As you see, this is a this is a naive network model, but is able to capture that codependence, which is nice. It is fully stochastic. Again, this is still Markovian, and we're able to really do likelihood-based inference. So this is uh, that's new in many respects. 
a lot of discussions already touched on this because a lot of bright people in the audience, right? So it is not natural in observational data to completely observe a contact network. And so instead, the other thing is not everything always has to be stochastic. I will even admit that. So if you have really good deterministic rule-based, for instance, models for the network, you have an initial network and you know, you say people will start interacting again after a certain time, or you have a policy that mandates that, then that can you know, fill in for the unobserved network data when you don't observe it, but still have that be part of the model. Um, I would love to combine this with, you know, for instance, even beyond that, but like an actual uh, rational economic framework, probably myopic decision-making to make it tractable. And um, this has been touched on too when we were talking about what this model is. When you have a certain set of disease statuses, the edges are happening based on your friends, as Christian put it, but those friends are not based on a priori friendship groups or anything like that. And we do wonder, you know, per class, per like healthy, healthy, infectious, infectious, or healthy, infectious, there's different rates. And within that class, they're kind of independent, like Greg was asking. But can we relax independence to something else, like exchangeability or something? I haven't thought deeply about that, but maybe some, um, some experts in the audience can think about what can be relaxed in a way that still maintains tractability. Yes. And then uh, just a little bit of teasers again at the end, uh, there are ways to try to extend this to harder missing data settings, such as uh, when infection times are also not known. So we don't know any of the infection or recovery times. So far, this work is without the network. But uh, the way that we've been doing this is actually allows general non-exponential non recovery distributions um, in, in this particular way of data augmentation. And just as a teaser on kind of the flavor of this, this approach, we're using a branching process but not the usual way we talk about branching process approximations. That's a univariate type. Here, um, this is actually maybe related to something uh, Greg mentioned in the morning talk. We only want to approximate the rate of the process, but we want to let everything still be a counting process, still be stochastic over each interval. And over each observation interval, the only thing we'll do is within the rate, we're going to let S. So usually S and I are changing, right? Of course, that's the overall infection rate. And we're just going to uh, decouple it so that S is changing, but I is uh, not changing within the rate. Okay, so what does this mean when you have S go to I? S is usually, you know, it's, it's, it's depleting. So in this case, because we've linearized the rate, it's a linear death process flowing into the second compartment, which is now a immigration with a constant rate over that interval death process. And so this becomes very tractable but it, it resembles the SIR rates very closely. And not only that, we're not gonna use this as an approximation to the SIR model per se for our inference, we're gonna use this very faithful approximation as a proposal density. And when we generate times from this process, there's a very nice property that lets us kind of do it very quickly, again, with like one line for the infections and one line for the removals because they're decoupled from the nonlinearity. Essentially, what this makes use of, I've mentioned conditional simulation can be hard for these processes. But if you have a Poisson process and you know that K events occurred, you know that those event times are independent, uh, are uniform. The order statistics of those event times are uniform. For these processes, there's a similar transformation that makes use of a similar property. So there's truncated exponentials instead, but they have closed forms. And so this lets us kind of put down the complete epidemic uh, very, very efficiently. But we can, uh, this is just to sh show you that if I have like six weeks of data and I observe it in, five, 10, and 50 total observations. As I observe more frequently and reset this branching process approximation, it looks almost identical to the SIR on this, on this particular example. And because it's very faithful, it allows me to do proposals in classical MCMC uh, and make big steps in the latent space and mix very efficiently. This is based on, you know, there's work uh, 20 years ago that does something within this same primitive, but is they're moving things one at a time and there's a, a reverse jump step and that, it basically becomes intractable for anything other than moderately sized outbreaks. But we're able to run this on really large data sets, real data sets, simulated data sets on a single laptop and get tons of samples in a couple of minutes with reasonable effective sample size. Bayesians can look at this trace plot and tell me it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good for these applications. So this is another teaser, uh, not really the focus of this talk, but hopefully I've convinced you to some extent that it is worth revisiting fully stochastic models, uh, even when we're interested in fitting data. Right? And there, there's a lot of advantages when we can do so. The model parameters are interpretable and also our estimates come with uncertainty quantification. And as we continue to relax assumptions, right, because these are still naive models, we'll eventually build to more reliable forecasting where we know what we are getting out of the models, given that the models are good. 
the Markov chain framework is extensible in a lot of ways. This recent stuff I showed you, again, we can relax the Markov assumption on that work, uh, but there's tons of open directions. Uh, a lot of the expertise in this audience can help. Um, and in particular, a lot of the things I've surveyed at the beginning, this is complementary to those approaches, right? I don't have any beef against those approaches. So it would be really interesting to combine them with instance for within sequential Monte Carlo. We're looking at a model that transitions to the differential equation stage after uh, some, some uh, appropriate amount of uh, the exact model um, propagates, et cetera. So I just do want to uh, thank at least the student collaborators here. Uh, Fan is in the audience and she's a, a postdoc with Mark Scuchard right now. She did the excellent work on the network case and is also on the job market. Uh, Raphael is a current PhD student at Duke Statistics uh, doing the most recent data augmentation work based on the bivariate branching process. And Jenny is an undergraduate who's doing excellent work on change point detection when beta is also a piecewise constant. So you get to let it be heterogeneous over time, but also simultaneously estimate sort of the model complexity of that rate uh, while having it parameterized by SIR dynamics. And she will be applying the PhD program, so you'll have to fight over her. So here's uh, some of the papers I've mentioned of our groups, um, and otherwise, thank you for your time. Yes, do you, do you have questions? Yes. I am a bit surprised that you <clears throat> don't uh, renormalize S by N. Hmm. Because, I mean, you expect the number of uh, infections per unit time to be proportional to the number of infectious individuals, but not to the number of susceptible individuals. <clears throat> and why, okay, okay, but why is it important? Because uh, when you, uh, in one of the last uh, slides, when you, uh, yes, this one. Why don't, I mean, if you would divide S by N, then what changes more slowly is S divided by N rather than I. So therefore, uh, why not uh, keep S divided by N constant? I mean, on the time, on this uh, time interval and have the I changing, you see what I mean? Uh, uh, kind of, I mean, uh, my initial reaction before you said let, Okay, so first of all, yes, you can do this. You, I think you can decide which one you want fixed. Right? Yes, because you linearize yeah. either the S equation or the I equation. Exactly. Um, and I think we- It's more nature. I mean, typically, typically S should be divided by N, so then you should really normalize, uh, yeah. linearize the I equation. Uh, the, so the, the one thing I don't understand, like when you say typically it's divided by N, I see that a lot, but I, I because, don't know that's up to me here because I'm just working with the actual counts, you know? And so I agree that this approximation whether it's good or not, it depends on the relative number of events in that time interval. And so I, I don't know what it would mean to divide S by N here. Um, well, because each in each in the, each infectious in, I mean encounters in other individuals at a certain rate, which is given by beta, <clears throat> and then that encounter will produce an infection if the encountered individual is susceptible, which is uh, which happens with probability S of T divided by N. Yes. I mean, then you can have another parameter, but- uh, Yeah, yeah I mean, the, I, the interpretation of beta would of course change. I'm not sure, it, I, so I'm not sure about the normalization with N, but I certainly think regardless, it, you, you might be right. It might be more natural to have S be the constant part. And I should think about that. Yes, that's a great idea. Thank you. Hey, excellent presentation, Jason, fantastic work. Okay. Yeah, I'm following up on the same. So epidemiologically speaking, what it means, uh, when you divide by n, so this one is mass action instance, which essentially means yeah. your uh, your your contact rate actually scales the total population if you look mm -hmm. at the formulation of epidemic model. Uh, but if you divide by n, is standard incidence. It means basically a contact contact rate is constant regardless of where you are. So if you are someone in the I class, you know, so you're transmitting at rate beta, but you're transmitting only to the proportion of the population that are currently susceptible. So that's why you have S of T divided by N of T. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, that's that's the idea. So, ah. so it's a distinction between mass action incidents and the standard incidents. Mass incident. action yeah, means, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So mass action means basically you, your contact okay. rate is uh, scaling with total population. Yeah. It's a proportional. But, but you're right. That, that might actually yeah. do better when, when you have more events. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah. Well, not to contradict uh, 
experts here, but to me, it seems it really depends on the stage of the infection. So if I'm in the beginning, where I is very small, it makes sense to keep S constants over some time period and say it effectively doesn't change much and I goes from one to five to 20, that's a branching process. Sure. But once you get into the time where you sort of has a lot of infected, you could probably do either. It's my guess. And, and one can probably, and probably in so that range, you. you could also do what did that you uh, just replace one of them by the integral. And, and you can do whatever you want as long as you fix your decision before running the MCMC, because otherwise you're in the adaptive territory and it's hard to preserve stationarity. I, I will say, yeah, so we're whichever one we choose, we're only approximating that contribution to the overall infection rate, right? So both S and I are changing in that interval. And that, that's important because I think a lot of models just say S is constant, but that's not the case here. S is changing, but the rate it's changing has one part that shouldn't be constant, that is. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> the question as well, but maybe it's because it went a bit fast. So <laughs> when uh, you know exactly the time at which people are infected, so I agree with you that you have a natural propo proposal law, but then you say um, at some point you don't know anymore uh, at whether the people are infected or not. And for me, this, um, this increases a lot the dimension of, uh, of the un unexplored space. And, and, I, and oh, yeah. do you have uh, like um, facts that tells you that your proposal is good or? Yeah, so that's... this is a great question. So first of all, in the network case, you're right. We assume we knew the infections. And then I move to the case where we don't for this. I don't know how to do this in the network case yet. But as far as whether the proposals are good, we can, we mostly empirically verified that this process is close. And of course we can, we can do studies on, I mean, it agrees as the time interval gets small. So that, that's an easy thing to prove. Uh, okay, I, I miss this. In fact, you don't know how to do it on networks. We don't know how to do that on networks, okay. no. Yeah, Good. I don't, yeah. Is there other questions? Are there other questions? So okay. I guess, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.